You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have Dr. Jennifer Conlon. Uh, she's AUD. I don't know what AUD versus PhD is, but she'll explain. Uh, she graduated from the University of North Texas with a doctorate of audiology. Well, I guess that explains that. Uh, she graduated magna cum laude from the University of North Texas with a Bachelor of Arts in Speech, Language, Pathology, and Audiology. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Audiology and has uh, a bunch of other speech and sound-related accolades. So, Jennifer, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, what, uh, what got you interested in speech and sound and hearing and all that many moons ago? Well, I was actually studying geochemistry at, at a previous time in life. But I am a musician, and I have misophonia and tinnitus, and I've had that throughout my life. So while I was a student in geochemistry, I was searching for answers about my misophonia, though at that time I didn't even know it had a name. And then through my searches, I found audiology, and I just fell in love. Because of my science background, this field combines physics, engineering, pathology, with human emotion and the human experience. And as an empath with a science and music background, it was just a match made in heaven. Yeah, it makes sense. But what is misophonia? And, you know, I always thought tinnitus was tinnitus. I remember the commercials about it like 30 years ago. So I call it tinnitus. But you know, what, yeah, what is that? And what's misophonia? I believe either pronunciation of tinnitus is considered correct. Um, misophonia is thought to be somewhat related to tinnitus. They often occur together. Misophonia is a negative emotional and physiological reaction to certain sounds, and research is still going on about what more we can do about misophonia, but for any of your listeners out there who have it, my heart goes out to you. It is definitely a struggle. It's thought to be successfully treated with tinnitus retraining therapy, uh, where you desensitize your brain and try to break those negative feedback loops where you hear a sound, you hate that sound, therefore your brain prioritizes that sound and it gets deeper ingrained in your brain. So tinnitus retraining therapy can kind of help break that cycle. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I have this, but I've also made fun of people that have had this, like, like, I hate whispering. I, I don't know. I just, it grates on my nerves. And my wife hates computerized voices. So I always used to tease her with computerized voices. And she would <laughs> tease me whisper sounds. And I know it's not a nice thing, but why do people have these? Uh, I don't know if that's considered misophonia or just like a neurosis, but uh, what are your thoughts on those two things? I think it can be. I think it can be related. A lot of misophonia reactive sounds are chewing sounds, crunching sounds. Um, smack noises, things like that, but you can definitely become sensitive to other, you know, non-human sounds, such as like a computerized voice that has no moisture sound to it. Um, anything that causes that negative feedback loop to continue, I think can be put in the misophonia category. Yeah, it's, it's weird what sounds do that and how they like I said, they grate on your nerves. I don't know. It's just, uh, I don't know why people have them. But, and unfortunately, like I said, they, you know, I'm, I've done it too. They probably get teased about it a lot. So it makes it worse, I guess. Yes, absolutely. So what's, um, what's the focus of your work? What kind of people do you work with and help? So our practice is called Love to Hear Again. And we strive to do exactly that. We want to help our patients 
absolutely love to hear again. We work with some children, but mostly older adults um, of all ages, really. I mean, just the adult population. Um, we have people who are getting cochlear implants or other hearing implants, middle ear implants, auditory brainstem implants, or bone conduction. And we work with tinnitus and misophonia and general hearing and balance concerns. So audiologists are doctors of hearing, balance, and any related disorders. We have undergraduate degrees, sometimes in related sciences, but not always. Um, the post-baccalaureate education is a four-year clinical doctorate in audiology. The last year of that doctorate is a clinical fellowship, which gives the budding audiologist full-time work and full-time hands-on training in the field and can be in the specialty that they're after. So mine was at um, the VA. So that's where I kind of specialized before I came to love to hear again. So what, um, I guess starting with tinnitus or tinnitus, I guess I like to call it tinnitus. See, is the audio component there too? <laughs> <laughs> um, what, is that just a ringing in your ears or what is it and how does it happen? Yes, it can be a ringing, more commonly a ringing in the ears, but it can also present as a range of sounds, phantom sounds. It can be a buzzing, a hissing, humming. Um, it can be intermittent where it comes and goes or it can be constant. Um, the severity of the tinnitus and the anxiety and negative emotions it causes within the person varies by individual. And again, the prevailing theory behind tinnitus is that negative feedback loop um, that we talked about with misophonia. But tinnitus can also have a physiological um, basis. So it can be a sign of other issues. And when you come to see an audiologist, we look for those underlying causes. If it's something that can be medically resolved, that's, that's what we would hope for. Sometimes it can be a tumor in the audit, auditory pathway, and there are tests that we perform that can help pick that, that up. Um, and sometimes we have people who come in for hearing aids because they have tinnitus, and hearing aids can help with tinnitus. And we look in their ears and find they're just impacted with earwax for, for some people for years. And then we remove the wax in office and the problem is largely resolved. So those are always wonderful days when we can resolve someone's yeah. issue that effectively. Yeah, definitely. But what, so what are some of the ways that synodis happens? What causes it? I know you kind of said it, but... A lot of times it's after noise-induced hearing loss. So a lot of military personnel and veterans, um, people who are musicians or go hunting and shooting a lot, any of those high risk hobbies or professions, those can induce a, what we call a noise induced hearing loss. It's thought that when the hair cells in the inner ear become sheared down from noise exposure, the brain knows it should be getting a response from those hair cells with incoming sound, but because the, the brain is not receiving that, that response from those hair cells, it's compensating by generating this high frequency tone that just becomes chronic. And then when someone hears that sound and becomes more aware of it, they feel a negative emotion towards it which further ingrains the brain's response to it and again continues that negative feedback loop well why would uh i don't know why would the brain want to reproduce that sound if it doesn't exist and what do you do to fix it man that is the million dollar question research is still ongoing in the areas of tinnitus and i'm feeling very positive about some of the research right now with um with different medical therapies that they're trying and Truly, we don't know exactly what is causing um, the brain to produce this phenomenon, but hearing aids are a great place to start after a medical cause has been eliminated. You can receive benefit just by having hearing aids in your ear because it's giving the brain the input that it's lacking. But for some people, they 
also do well with a masking noise. So that masking noise can be a comforting sound or it can be tailored to the hearing loss. So if there is a specific area of loss in the patient's audiogram or hearing test results, we can focus that masking noise to fit within a band right in that area that they're lacking. And with the brain getting something else to focus on and getting that proper input, also in combination with meditation, mindfulness exercises, and emotional control, we can try to train the brain to lessen its generation of this phantom sound and optimally stop generating it. But that can take some work and take a lot of time. It requires a lot of patience um, from, from the sufferer, but it, there is relief out there. And a lot of people think that there's not. So I hope that more and more people will realize there are things you can do. Well, what, what does the masking sound do? I was imagining what if you were able to match the exact frequency of the sound people hear you know, when they have tinnitus and you played that for them continuously for a few minutes, you know, what would that do to their brain? Well, it depends on the level that it's presented at. So you can tailor it. We do something called tinnitus matching, where we match the pitch and also the perceptive loudness of that person's tinnitus. And then when you put in the masker noise, you don't want to cover the tinnitus up because once you turn the masking noise off, the brain will, it, it's gonna feel like your ringing is overwhelming. You wanna gently introduce that new sound right underneath the level of the ringing in your head. And then you're giving your brain something else to focus on. So the brain takes that sound that it is generating and lowers it in priority. And then theoretically, you can lower the masker again, and then your brain will calm down with the tinnitus a little bit more. So you kind of chase the ringing down using that masker as a type of therapy. So you like tease the, the sound to a lower, lower amplitude in your head? Yes. Makes sense. Oh, is that a strange question? You know, like they say uh, people are kinesthetic or visual or auditory. Does that seem to play into the kind of problems they have or how they respond to therapies? I don't have any research to say definitively, but I personally would say absolutely. Yes, I think that that affects a lot of areas of hearing, tinnitus, um, and misophonia, especially, things like that. The, the hearing sensory pathway in the brain is massive. Um, so when somebody is even more auditorily focused, I think tinnitus would have a higher chance of becoming increasingly worse, if that makes sense. But, you know, have you tried to characterize the people you've worked with, like, oh, you know, anecdotally, the people that are very auditory are easier to treat for it or harder to treat for it, you know, or visual people for some reason, or non-auditory people, they're, I don't know, they're more resistant to treatment or easier to treat? Yes, there are some people that are a little bit um, more challenging they have certain sound preferences. And that's an important part about people finding an audiologist and approaching hearing health or tinnitus is to find an audiologist who kind of understands your way of thinking and respects that your brain processes sound very uniquely. Everyone experiences sound differently. So people who are musicians like me, we can tend to be a little more picky and harder to fit with hearing aids because we have more acute pitch matching and we're very critical of sound. So having sound come in and be being processed through a hearing aid, that can be tough for us to adjust to. So I would say that musicians especially who are so in tune to sound and auditory input, they are a special population for treating. It would be cool if they had, uh, I guess they do have hearing aids that are tuned to improve conversation. And I wonder if they have ones with different settings where if you're going to listen to music, you could change the algorithm of the hearing aid so it's better for music. Or, you know, if you're going to be in a, uh, an environment with a lot of ambient noise, that it dampens it more. Yes, absolutely. So that is the entire purpose behind hearing aids is to lower background noise and improve your speech understanding, make speech clear and audible. And then hearing aids expanded out into music. And I think they have done an amazing job at music processing. 
Mm. So hearing aids are programmed for each individual's hearing loss. And then after that prescription is generated for the person, that's when we go in and we fine tune that programming for that particular patient's preference. Music is a large part of that. Hearing aids have music music focused processing in them. They come with music programs or they can be added onto. However, I find it better to custom make a music program, even building off of the one that is built into the hearing aid. And the reason I like to fine tune those so specifically is because people like their music differently. Some people really like a bass, a nice rounded full sound, and other people yeah. like tinnier music with more high frequency focus and much less bass. So I, I really like to get in there and fine tune. And since I am a musician, that's a particular interest of mine. When, when people come in and they are particularly focused on music processing, I get quite excited. Have you ever had, any, have you ever had anyone say like, you know, when my husband or wife yells at me, can you tune the hearing aid so I can't hear them? Yes, all that almost every day I have somebody say that. Really? It, oh man. It cracks me <laughs> up every time. That's the oldest joke in the in the hearing world, I guess, huh? Yes, absolutely. Oh well. I'll try to find a better one. Huh. Um what's uh in terms of hearing aids, are some better than others? Like uh, I you know, I'm not saying to trash or elevate any brands, but are there like different flavors of hearing aids that work better than others or work differently? Absolutely. Every manufacturer of hearing aids is is different. They process sound differently. Um, now with the increase in over-the-counter hearing aids and discount insurance provided hearing aids, um, that conversation is particularly important. Um, hearing aids within each brand or manufacturer, they also come in different technology levels. Each of those levels that vary on cost also vary on sound quality and noise reduction. There are advanced features such as now um, they are incorporating AI technology, which is really exciting. That's been a brand new development in, I would say, released within the last year. They are coming with artificial intelligence, um, language translation, um, fall detection for um, elderly people who are fall risks, uh, even fitness trackers for younger wearers or older wearers, um, just like Fitbit. They'll count your steps and heart rate. So we're entering a new age of not only sound processing, but the entire functionality of hearing aids is really growing. And there is no substitution for a good quality hearing aid. People, of course, are cost focused and that's understandable, but over-the-counter devices and insurance discount devices, they typically are more geared towards being an amplifier. They're really going to take everything across the board and just raise it up. And people who have tough to treat hearing losses or pick up background noise very easily, they're going to be miserable in cheap discounted devices. The major manufacturers do produce really nice quality devices. There's just no substitute for those. Yeah, I guess it's like a cheap boom box versus a nice like hi-fi system, you know. Yes, exactly. I guess yeah, the other cheapest thing would be to find some ram's horn and put it up to your ear like this right <laughs> like a thousand years ago. Yes, I'm still looking for an old acoustic horn to hang in my office. I haven't found one yet, but one day. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, what was I going to ask you? Oh, can people do, um, I don't know, listening exercises to restore some of their hearing? Can you do any of that? You know, like, I don't know, learn how to sing or learn how to, you know, play piano and learn the pit or again, just do different voice exercises or hear, hear different sounds you don't normally hear to retrain your ears? In a sense. So hearing itself can't be restored at this point in time, but you bring up an excellent point about what we call oral rehabilitation. 
um, when someone gets a cochlear implant or any hearing implant or hearing aids, training yourself and your ears with sound that you have not heard in a very long time is critical to your success with those devices. At first, things sound very strange because your brain is suddenly like, where is this input coming from? I, I, this isn't right. The more you can get yourself hearing those sounds, you're retraining your brain to know where those sounds are coming from, what they are, and why they're, they're important. Your brain begins to recategorize what is normal because before your brain said, this hearing loss is my normal. And then once you get the hearing aids or the implant activated and you can sit down and read along with audiobooks, anything like that, watching TV with proper captioning, it really assists your brain in relearning those sounds and becoming used to them again. It's interesting what you just said because um, I worked at um, a factory years ago and one of the older guys, I remember he told me, he's like, yeah, you get hearing loss after a while because of the background noise of the machines. So maybe the mechanism was that his brain got used to hearing those machines for 20, 30 years. And when he didn't hear them, the brain thought it was normal to hear them. So it manufactured that exact sound in his head. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's like a um, kind of an acoustic uh, perceptive phenomenon. I've heard that not quite as commonly as other complaints, but those phantom sounds definitely do exist. Yeah, I just wonder if that was maybe the mechanism, but who knows? Huh. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to ask you from earlier on. You know, like um, the mesophonia, the misophonia, there's certain sounds that people hate and can't tolerate. But at the same time, now there's these videos on YouTube called ASMR, where I guess some people love to hear like crackling or whispering or you know, other weird sounds that other people would hate and they just... I don't know, it just gives them a, a chilly feeling or a happy feeling for some reason. Have you tried those? Yes, I was looking into those recently, and I haven't had any profound experiences yet, but I'm still on the hunt for some good, um, what is it, ASMR? Yeah, yeah, I don't the, know what the acronym stands for, but uh, that's what it is, ASMR. And one of the treatment approaches for misophonia is desensitizing yourself to certain sounds. I would caution people who have misophonia to approach that carefully and most likely with a professional because your emotional reaction is extremely important. Your relaxation is extremely important, but some of those crackling sounds could help a lot of people with misophonia who possibly have reaction to crunching sounds. If you were able to ease yourself into hearing sounds like that and desensitize yourself, you're breaking that negative feedback loop. And I think that could be very, very useful. Have you run into anyone um, that has like super hearing or really unusual hearing that sticks out at you? Yes, yes. I'm, there are quite a few people who have hypersensitive hearing. So hyperacusis is sensitivity to loud sound. But often people who have extraordinarily sensitive hearing, um, they are sometimes categorized with hyperacusis, just having sound sensitivity. And we see those patients with thresholds that anything from 25 dBHL to negative 10 dBHL, that's all normal. But I do occasionally have people come through and their thresholds are negative five or negative 10 across the board. And they have very hypersensitive hearing. Still normal, but I always congratulate them on their very, very sensitive hearing. Well, then again, it could be bad. I know there's some people that have to wear like earphones in order to go anywhere and they, they can't be around noise. It, it hurts them. You know? Yes, that is more hyperacusis. And definitely um, that's a challenge to to treat. and. Ironically, there are many people who have hearing loss who also have hyperacusis, and it's, it's a terrible duo, but they commonly occur together. So it's important that an audiologist is programming accordingly and testing accordingly. We have to make sure we're not putting patients in any situation where sound is painful. So if you're having hearing problems, are there different, you know, like in, with your eyes as an optometrist, but an ophthalmologist kind of is a higher standard. 
what what are they called in the world of hearing? Like what are the levels of people you can see and who is the most skilled? Well, an audiologist is kind of akin to an optometrist. So we we handle hearing and the perception of hearing and balance, but we we work with otolaryngology, which is ENT physicians. We work hand in hand with them. So the closest to your example, I think would be the audiologist would be akin to the optometrist and the otolaryngologist would be akin to the ophthalmologist. So we refer to the ENT physician if we find any signs of an acoustic neuroma or a tumor, an ear infection, anything that needs medications, surgery, or further medical evaluation or treatment, they are our go-to. And then outside of that, we also work with like speech pathologists and neurootologists. We have a lot of patients who have suffered strokes. So that becomes an all around approach. We work with many professionals for that one patient to make sure that we are improving their hearing as well as we can in conjunction with their speech therapy, their medical treatments, et cetera. How does hearing affect someone's mental state? I've heard for some reason that, I don't know, if it's correlated, but people with dementia tend to have hearing loss or hearing loss leads to dementia faster and any validity there? Yes, because the the sensory pathways for hearing in the brain are so large that when those neural pathways, like any muscle, when they begin to atrophy and decline from not being used, it can increase the risk of global dementia. Aside from that, hearing loss has this spider web effect on quality of life, and it is heavily linked to depression, social and familial withdrawal, which will just feed right back into depression when someone becomes isolated. And also struggling to hear and understand is very exhausting. And because the brain has redefined that as normal, Many people don't realize how exhausted they're becoming day to day. And then they get hearing aids or an implant and they're like, oh my gosh, I have more energy. My depression is better. It just has this huge effect on all around health and well-being. Yeah, that's super interesting. Huh. I, mean, I, guess, I guess the only experience I can relate maybe is um, I once went to Honduras for like a week. And I know Spanish pretty well, but I'm not fluent. And in the beginning of the day, I could understand everything. And by nighttime, I was so tired. I was just like, forget it. And I couldn't understand anything. So I wonder how much of it was just the listening was exhausting me. I bet it had something to do with it. I think that's a great example of, of what someone with hearing loss would, would be struggling with at the end of the day. Hmm, interesting. Okay. And also oh. um, the... The people around the hearing impaired individual have a, have a large impact. Uh, too often, patients come to me and they report that their family members get frustrated with them or begin to yell at them or scold them, when in reality, it's not that they can't hear you. They can't understand you. And that's a huge difference. And when they can't understand you, scolding and yelling isn't going to help because more often someone with hearing loss will give up. They, they won't participate in the conversation or they'll just pretend that they heard you. So I think support and kindness from friends and family is more important than anything. That support system is critical, especially for subsequent depression or dementia risk. You know, their emotional health begins to suffer. Yeah, it makes sense. I guess I'm kind of experiencing that a little bit when um, someone speaks and they turn away from me, I can't hear them. So exactly. I don't know if I'm getting hearing loss or, but, but it's frustrating. You know? Yeah. I guess I can't help feeling like if someone speaks really low that it just agitates me. It's like, speak up. I can't hear you. You know, so yes. I guess maybe and I'm experiencing that very thing. Yes. And a lot of times family members will, will speak to them from another room. And when you have hearing loss, particularly a high frequency hearing loss, which is extremely common, you rely so much on watching someone's mouth in order to understand, even when you don't realize it, those visual cues are very important. 
And so speaking to them with your back turned or while chewing or from another room, it, it's just putting them at an even greater disadvantage. Makes sense. Well, um, well, I have one last question. It's kind of a strange one. Have you, have you ever worked with anyone that has foreign accent syndrome? I saw this on YouTube and I thought it was like, you know, I, I couldn't help but think it was funny, but also very sad if it happened to somebody. I don't know if you've ever encountered that. I'm not sure I've ever heard of that before. I guess there's some people that they either have trauma or not, and they wake up and they speak with a different accent and they can't not speak that way. And they hear themselves having spoken before in the way they used to, but they can't replicate it. It's called foreign accent syndrome. I guess I'm, I'm sending you to YouTube a lot, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, I heard of that. Like, is that the same thing as when someone has surgery, like dental surgery, and then they wake up with like a Scottish accent? Oh, I didn't know dental surgery. <laughs> It was some, I, yeah. I saw something yep. like that, and I was like, I want to wake up with a Scottish accent, as long as it's an accent I like. Well, yeah, exactly. So I just wondered, since you're in the hearing world, if you've ever encountered anyone, or if you know anyone that has ever encountered anyone that has it. I'm sure it's rare, but... I've yeah, I have never met anyone with that, but if there's anyone out there who has that, who's in my area, please come see me. I would just, I would love to talk to you about that. Yeah, and I don't mean to laugh, but it is what it is. It's just, it's just very strange that that would happen. I'm sure that the person feels awful, but it's strange. They can't, uh, I don't know, they can't go back to the way they were. Yeah, that's sad. I, I would encourage them to embrace the new accent. People love people with accents. I would say embrace it. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, last question or so. Any relation to vertigo or dizziness and hearing issues? Do you ever encounter oh, ab- that? Absolutely. And the... The balance organ is in the same area as your, your hearing organ. They're connected and they share fluid. So having hearing loss or hearing problems, tinnitus and balance problems, they often occur together. I would say about half of my patients who come in for hearing loss also have vertigo. Um, that's extremely common. And we work with physical therapists and occupational therapists as well to address balance concerns and vertigo. And research showed that success and better outcomes from physical therapy for vertigo were found with people once they got hearing aids. Once they were properly fit with hearing aids, their, uh, their balance was greatly improved. And that's something that really fascinates me. Yeah, that is interesting. I guess, you know, the body is informed by all its senses. All the cells are informed by all our senses. So when one is missing or a part of it's missing, the body probably has to make up for it in other ways somehow. So it strains it, makes it tired, and it's probably not as effective. That's just my speculation. Yes, I, I completely agree. Well, very good. So what's the best way for people to, uh, to get in touch, you know, with your office and then uh, in general how to find out more about hearing-related issues? Well, we are Love to Hear Again Audiology in Grapevine, Texas. We do have a website, and that is lovetohearagain.com. It is L-O-V-E, the number two, and then hearagain.com. Our office number is 817-722-6156, and we also have opened up our online appointment scheduling to help patients get an appointment scheduled just anytime, not having to rely on on our office hours. And there's so much out there about hearing and hearing loss. The ASHA website, American Speech Language Hearing Association, has wonderful resources, as well as the American Academy of Audiology website. And I would encourage everyone if if they think they have a hearing loss, they're putting it off, or, or they think, I'll wait until it gets worse. Please go see an audiologist. We are your friends. And find an audiologist that you like, that you feel listened to, you feel cared for. You're not just another patient. And that's what we value here. That's how we treat our patients like they are family to us. We will stay late for them. We will do house calls if they have suffered an injury. We love our patients here. And I hope for anyone out there listening that they find an audiologist who cares for them the same way. Because hearing is so important and 
quality of life is so important and everyone deserves to have good hearing and a great quality of life. That's great. Well, Jennifer, thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I had a great time talking with you. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.